Okay. So we are. Yeah, I like watching those old shows. But anyway, hello everybody. Hello. How y'all doing? Great. Oh, it is for a moment, huh? Had some serious downpours today. Whoo! And snow. What the heck's going on? And hail. Bipolar. Bipolar weather. I like that. Does that mean we're in between the North and the South Polar? Or what? Okay. Well, we are. <laughs> Somebody take your meds. All right. Enough of that tomfoolery. So, did y'all have a good Easter weekend? Absolutely. Sunday? It was amazing. It was amazing, wasn't it? Wow. Uh, the play was very cute. Yeah, I thought they did a great job. It was a lot of fun. And uh, I don't think I've ever seen the sanctuary with standing room only. Uh, where you got to get up and tell everybody, could you please squeeze in a little bit, you know? And it's like, Really? And they're looking at me like, but this is my safe space. I... But this is where I always <laughs> Yeah. We're going to break some molds. Oh. Huh. Oh, no. We don't want to do that because we are live right now. The whole world would hear it. <laughs> yeah, put it on her, will you? All right, you guys. We are running late again. Surprise. Let's pray so we can get started. Father, we do want to give you thanks tonight, Lord, for your word. We want to give you thanks tonight for, for Jesus and that great sacrifice he made for us, Lord. And it's so awesome to have celebrated your resurrection on Sunday and to been with so many, Lord, to, to share that with. And uh, uh, we just want to thank you for the kids and the great job that they did and how they blessed so many people. Father, we just want to ask you tonight, Lord, that you would just open your word to us. Lord, that you would help us to uh, draw from it uh, the lessons that you want us to, to learn tonight. And just bless it, God. We just pray that you would anoint it, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. All right. So we're going to pick this up. We're going to actually be in chapter 20. Somebody showed me that that's where we're at in chapter 20. So. But there is a couple things I want to back up just a little bit because to keep everything in context, um, we have some serious politics that are going on here and some serious family feuds that are getting ready to uh, blow up in Israel. And those feuds are going to be between Judah and Israel. So you know Israel was comprised of ten tribes. Judah of two. So, but Jerusalem was part in Judah, and David was from the tribe of Judah. Judah. So, he has a direct bloodline there. And if you take a look um, in uh, the prior chapter, in chapter 19, let's just go back to verse 41 to kind of give us a little bit of context here. It says, Just then all the men of Israel came to the king and said to the king, Why have our brethren, the men of Judah, stolen you away and brought the king, his household, and all of David's men with him across the Jordan? And so all the men of Judah answered the men of Israel, Because the king is a close relative of ours. Why then are you angry over this matter? Have we ever eaten at the king's expense, or has he given us any gifts? And the men of Israel answered the men of Judah, and they said, We have ten shares in the king. Therefore, we also have more rights to David than you. Why then do you despise us? Were we not the first to advise bringing back our king? Yet the words of the men of Judah were fiercer than the words of the men of Israel." So we can see what's going on here. Now David's crossed back over the river. He had pomp and circumstance coming back into the city. He's reestablished in the king's palace. 
He uh, reestablishes the king over Israel and Judah. And now suddenly we're having this little squabble that's starting to take place between these two groups of people. There's jealousy, there's insecurity, there's you're stepping on my toes going on, there's our rights are more than your rights. And it's amazing to me that after all that they've been through, all the bloodshed, all the battles, all the running and hiding and all the stuff we've studied, now they're all back in the land together and they're arguing. They can't even get along for a very short period of time, and they're already at each other's throats. So, and when we pick this up in, uh, in chapter 20, we, we realize that, of course, the political situation in the area is a mess. And whenever that happens, the nation is ripe for a leader to rise up and lead the people astray. Whenever people are confused like this, it's easy for a false leader to rise up. If you wanted to say a false prophet, but not necessarily a prophet, but um, a dastardly person who doesn't have the best interest of the people in heart, at heart. So we're going to pick this up in chapter 20. And it says that there happened to be there a rebel whose name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, Bichri. Bitri, a Benjamite, and he blew a trumpet and he said, We have no share in David, nor do we have inheritance in the sons of Jesse. Every man to his tents, O Israel. So every man of Israel deserted David and followed Sheba, the son of Bitri. And the men of Judah, from the Jordan as far as Jerusalem, remained loyal to their king. Now David came to his house at Jerusalem, and the king took the ten women, his concubines, whom he had left to keep the house, and he put them in seclusion and supported them, but he did not go into them. So they were shut up until the day of their death, living in widowhood. So we had talked about this a little while ago about these concubines and all these different women that the leaders would accumulate to themselves. And we did mention Solomon and all the women that was, you know, that he had collected and uh, how some of them were, they were all groomed. They were all special and they had been given the best beauty treatments and uh, hairdos and the skin treatments and to keep them beautiful and to keep them desirable because perhaps the king might call upon them to come and visit him in his, in his bedroom one night, right? Um, and of course Solomon, you know, we knew that he had, uh, what, 300 of them or something like that, some crazy amount. Um, so I would imagine most of those women probably died and never did uh, spend time with the king. But here we see something pretty interesting. It's, it's kind of unique what David does here. David has a little collection too. He has concubines. He has women. He has all different kinds of things going on. And he puts them in a little housing area there in Jerusalem and feeds them and cares for them and probably treats them very, very well. But he never, ever calls on any of them. So they live their lives alone and grow old and they die, and it says that they were shut up until the day of their death. That doesn't mean they weren't allowed to talk. It means that they were closed in, closed in the house or into a room or whatever. And so it goes on to say in verse 4, And the king said to Amasa, Assemble the men of Judah for me within three days, and be present here yourself. So Amasa went to assemble the men of Judah. But he delayed longer than the set time which David had appointed him. And David said to Abishai, Now Sheba, the son of Betri, will do us more harm than Absalom. So take your Lord's servants and pursue him, lest he find for himself fortified cities and escape us. So Joab's men, with the Cherethites and the Pilathites and all the mighty men, went out after him. And they went out of Jerusalem to pursue Sheba 
the son of Betri. So we have a little power struggle going on here too about who's the commander of the army. We have Joab, we have Amasa. Um, he goes to Amasa uh, to commission him to go out and, and dispatch uh, um, this guy that's trying to cause a rebellion in, 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 uh, in Israel. Um, but you got to remember that um, Joab was the commander of the armies, but Joab had kind of been shaky in relationship with David uh, because of some things that had happened. And so he turns, David turns to Amasa. And of course, there's going to be some jealousy going on. There's going to be some power struggles going on with these two men also. So you've got two groups of people that are heading out trying to find this, uh, this fellow that's heading up this uh, rebellion against David. So Joab's men um, went out, and they went out of Jerusalem to hunt down Sheba. In verse 8, when they were at the large stone, which is in Gibeah, Gibeon, Amasa came before them. So Amasa was in front of Joab, and uh, it says that uh, Amasa came before them, and it said Joab was dressed in his battle armor, and on it was a belt with a sword fastened in its sheath at his hips. And as he was going forward, it fell out. So it had slipped out of the sheath as he's riding his little chariot, um, bouncing around or whatever, and it, it comes loose and it, it falls out, not to the ground, but it just come out of the sheath. And uh, Joab hooks up with Amasa on the way, and he said to Amasa, Are you in health, my brother? So how you doing? How you feeling? How's things going? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. But Amasa did not notice the sword that was in Joab's hand, and he struck him with it in the stomach. <clears throat> and his entrails entrails poured out on the ground. Wow, the Bible doesn't hold back any punches, does it? The good, the bad, and the ugly here. And he did not strike him again. Thus he died. And then Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued Sheba, the son of Betri. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, one of Joab's men stood near Amasa, and said, Whoever favors Joab, and whoever is for David, follow Joab. But Amasa wallowed in his blood in the middle of the highway. And when the man saw that all the people stood still, he moved Amasa from the highway to the field and threw a garment over him. And when he saw that everyone who came upon him halted, when he was removed from the highway, all of the people went after Joab to pursue Sheba, the son of Betri. So this guy's had his entrails spilled all over the ground. He's laying there in the middle of the road. He's bleeding to death. And all of these people that are supposed to be pursuing Sheba, they're taken back by this. They're, they're standing still. They're, they're in shock seeing this man laying there. Amasa dying from this wound. And so in order to keep the people moving, this fellow decides to drag him off the road, off into the bushes, somewhere where he can't be seen. This is a great military commander, and this is how he met his end. It's kind of sad when you think about that, um, that he was left alone in the bushes, and that's where he ended his uh, breath. Was, was there, and once he was moved out of the way, it was business as usual, and they continued to pursue Sheba, the son of Betri. And verse 14 says, And he went through all the tribes of Israel, to Abel and Beth Maaka, and all of the Berites. And so they were gathered together, and also went after Sheba. So they're running around gathering up all these people to go after this guy Sheba. And then it says they came to and besieged him in Abel 
of Beth Maaka. Abel is, of course, a city, and they know that um, Sheba has hole up in this city. It has fences or walls, so he feels safe within the confines of this city. And all of the armies of Judah are pursuing him at, uh, to Abel. It says that they cast up a siege mount against the city, and it stood by the rampart. So they built this mount thing that enabled them to have protection, but yet would not allow anybody to leave the city. They sieged it. They, no one could come out, no one could go in, no trading, no food, nothing. Um, that was an <clears throat> old military tactic that was used often in uh, those times. You starve them out. They might have a great army in there. They might have walls. They might have all this stuff. But if we're surrounded them and we have the advantage and they can't come and go, then they're going to starve to death or they're going to surrender one or the other. So that's the plan for the people in Abel. But you've got to remember, this is a town with a bunch of people living in it that have nothing to do with this guy Sheba. He's just taking refuge there with his guys. So all the people, it says uh, in verse 15, they had besieged uh, Abel and they built this mound against the city and all the people who were with Joab battered the wall to throw it down. So they're throwing stones at it. They're throwing whatever they can throw at it, uh, ramming rods or whatever to knock, this, to knock the wall down. Verse 16 says, Then a wise woman cried out from the city, Hear, hear, please say to Joab, Come nearby that I may speak with you. And when he had come near to her, the woman said, Are you Joab? He answered, I am. And then she said to him, Hear the words of your maidservant. And he answered, I am listening. So she spoke, saying, they used to talk in former times, saying, They shall surely seek guidance at Abel, and so they would end disputes. I am among the peaceable and the faithful in Israel. You seek to destroy a city and a mother in Israel. Why would you swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? And Joab answered, and he said, Far be it. Far be it from me that I should swallow up or destroy. So this woman, she's the governor of the city, the mayor, whatever she is. She's, she's a wise woman, it says here. And she's speaking, uh, it says, in former times. There was some sort of a prophecy that had uh, been announced that there would come a day when... Israel would come to Abel and they would seek guidance. And then that would end all these disputes. So she's going to them to offer advice, wisdom to Joab. And she's saying, look, you know, we're, we're, we love David. We, we're peaceable. We're not war, warring people. And you're going to come into the city and you're going to destroy all of us innocent people for the sake of Sheba. And Joab realizes, he says, far be it I, that I should swallow up or destroy. Verse 21, that is not so. But a man from the mountains of Ephraim, Sheba, the son of Betri by name, has raised his hand against the king, against David. Deliver him only, and I will depart from the city. And so the woman said to Joab, Watch, his head will be thrown to you over the wall. <laughs> Woo! Then the woman, in her wisdom, went to all the people, and they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Betri, and they threw it out to Joab. And then he blew the trumpet, and they withdrew from the city, every man to his tent. 
So Joab returned to the king at Jerusalem. So what an interesting story, huh? They hurled this dude's head over the wall out into Joab's army so that they could see that he took care of, of, of Sheba. And therefore, this woman basically saves the whole city. She, she keeps all of them from being wiped out. And uh, Joab, in his wisdom, says, look, I'm really not after you. I'm after one guy. Uh, so if you can turn him over to me. Well, she did better than that. She didn't bother turning him over. She just chopped his head off and threw it over the wall, right? So kind of an interesting story there, I thought. Um, you never know where some of these heroes in the Bible are going to come from. This woman, we don't know who she is. Um, we don't know much about her, but we do know that she was a leader, and she was a wise person, and she saved her city. Now, verse 23, um, what we have in verse 23 down to the end of the chapter is just a list of some of the people who were in charge over David's army in Israel. Joab was the main commander over all of the army. Um, and there were many different divisions of the army. There were different family lines, tribal lines, if you will, that were uh, individual in, within the army. And so we have Benaniah, or Benaiah, how you say that, I don't know, the son of Jehoiada. <laughs> he was over the Cherethites and the Pelethites. So this fella has charge over that portion. And then there was Adoram, and he was in charge of revenue. And then there was Jehoshaphat, the son of Elilud. He was the recorder. And then Shiva, he was the scribe. Zadok and Abathar were the priests. And Ira, the Jairite, was a chief minister under David. So this is his staff, if you will. This is his cabinet. And uh, we see here that we have um, a guy in charge of the economy. We have a guy in charge of recording all of the events that were taking place. Then we had Shiva, who was a scribe, and uh, Zadok and Abathar, the priests. So David already has established his ruling uh, group of men here. And in chapter 21, we have an issue that comes up with a famine. Interesting, when we read about this famine, why it was happening. And we'll find that out. It says that there was a famine in the days of David for three years. So the famine, basically, it's not raining. The crops aren't growing. The people are going hungry. And so far, three years have gone by uh, in this drought, which caused famine. And so year after year, David inquired of the Lord. And the Lord answered and said, It is because of Saul and his bloodthirsty house, because he killed the Gibeonites. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. The children of Israel had sworn protection to them, but Saul had sought to kill them in his zeal for the children of Israel and Judah. So there was a pact made to this group of Gibeonites who were not Jews that they would not be harmed by um, David or anybody else in Israel. But Saul in his, uh, you might notice in uh, verse 1 of 21, it says it's because Saul was bloodthirsty. Saul wiped out these people when they were under the impression that they were being protected. He backstabbed them. He went in and, and killed them all and broke that, 
that oath, that treaty, if you will, uh, that they had made. And because of that act, God is saying that's why the famine has come. So you look at that and you think, now wait a minute, that was, that was way back. That was a few years back here when Saul was doing all of his dastardly deeds and running around doing all that stuff. And God is just now getting around to uh, bringing the, what do you call the chickens home to roost, so to speak, right? Kind of a strange thing, isn't it? Well, it was business that needed to be dealt with. It was a travesty that was done to these poor people. And because it was never atoned for, it was never, um, there was never any apology or ask for forgiveness or restoration. They were just wiped out and they were left. And so God said, this is something that you need to deal with. You need to get this dealt with and taken care of. So now here finally we get to this place where we can look at something and say, does this point to me or us? Does this tell me that it's really important that I keep a short account with God? Does this tell me that there are things that perhaps have happened in our past that maybe we haven't repented of. Maybe we haven't tried to make amends. Um, maybe we're harboring um, some sort of brutality or uh, some sort of abuse of another person or, or whatever it might be. And we think that we have gotten away with it. We think... Because time is going by, nothing's happening, God didn't notice it. <laughs> but he notices everything, doesn't he? And I think it just kind of points to the idea that, you know, God wants us to flush out those things in our, in our lives. Because even years and years later, in this case, it brought famine. What about spiritual famine in our lives perhaps because we've harbored something we haven't dealt with it and God is speaking to us and maybe telling us you know you need to you need to take care of that uh, whatever it might be now I don't really know you know if I can sit here and tell you that's what God does every single time because there's a lot of things in our lives that have happened that we never gave an account for. Um, that maybe God has thrown as far as the east is from the west. Right? To remember it no more. And that of course is what Christ accomplished on the cross. Our forgiveness of sin. But I look at it and I think to myself. You know we can do a lot of damage with bad decision making. And sometimes the results of that bad decision making it doesn't raise its ugly head for years but you can bet the bible says very clearly you can bet that your sin will find you out it's going to catch up one way or the other right that's kind of a sobering thought i don't know about you guys but you know it makes me kind of shake in my boots because it makes me want to remember. Are there things that I need to take care of? Is there maybe somebody that I've harmed? Or you know something that I've been harboring in there. And I don't want anything to get in the way of my relationship with God. So the king calls the Gibeonites and he spoke to them. And in verse 3 it says that David said to them. He wants to make atonement. He wants to make it right. He said, what shall I do for you? And with what shall I make atonement that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord? What can I give you? How much can I pay you? Can I bring you food? What do you, what do you want in order to forgive our trespass? To, to bless Israel so that perhaps it will rain and the famine will end if in fact that's what caused the famine. And the Gibeonites, they answered and they said, We will have no silver 
or gold from Saul or from his house, nor shall you kill any man in Israel for us. So he said, whatever you say, I will do it for you. The Gibeonites had every reason in the world to seek vengeance against the house of Benjamin, against Saul's people because of what Saul did. And speaking in verse 5, they're talking about Saul when they, they answered the king. And they said, as for the man who consumed us and plotted against us, that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the territories of Israel, let seven men of his descendants be delivered to us, and we will hang them before the Lord in Gibeah of Saul, whom the Lord chose. And the king said, I will give them. So they want to make almost a sacrifice with these guys. They want to hang them, execute them before the Lord in Gibeah. And so the king, he agrees they're going to go get seven of Saul's sons from all the different women that he had had children with. And David's going to send them over to, to the Gibeonites and they're going to execute them. They're going to hang them before the Lord to recompense for the evil that, that they had done to them. But the king, he spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the Lord's oath that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. So that oath that he made to Jonathan way back years and years earlier, he's still honoring that oath. And you remember this young man, Mephibosheth, um, one of the descendants of the sons of Saul who had a, a right to the throne, basically, but he's crippled. Um, David brings him into the palace and Mephibosheth is living with David and he's coming and going and he's doing great. And because he promised um, Jonathan that, that he would spare him. And so David, in verse 8, took Ar Armani. And Mephibosheth, this is a different Mephibosheth, the two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Ayah, whom she bore to Saul, and the five sons of Michal, the daughter of Saul, whom she brought up for Adriel, the son of Barzillai, <laughs> the Meholathite. Whew. Wow. So he rounds up seven of them. Now, we look at this and we think, now wait a minute, I thought Michal never had any children. She, was, she never did have kids. But she raised these sons from another woman. And so he rounds them all up and he delivers them into the hand of the Gibeonites. And they hanged them on the hill before the Lord. And so they fell, all seven together, and were put to death in the days of harvest, in the first days, in the beginning of the barley harvest. So they execute these people at a time of the year when they should have been out harvesting um, the fields, um, but because of the famine, there was probably nothing to harvest. So these guys get executed for something that Saul did, and once again we see this trickle-down thing that, that happens, how Saul's bad choices now have trickled down once again uh, to his family. And they're paying the price. And it's very likely that maybe uh, each one of these boys were in on it. Maybe they supported the slaughter of the Gibeonites along with their father. 
Uh, a lot of times we, we see that happening. So in verse 10, it says that Rizpah, the daughter of Aya, took sackcloth and spread it for herself on the rock. From the beginning of harvest until the late rains poured on them from heaven. And she did not allow the birds of the air to rest on them by day, nor the beasts of the fields by night. And David was told what Rizpah, the daughter of Aya, the concubine of Saul, had done. So David went and he took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, and the men of Jabesh Gilead, who had stolen them from the street of Bethshan, where the Philistines had hung them up after the Philistines struck down Saul in Gilboa. And so he brought the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from there. And they gathered the bones of those who had been hanged. And they buried the bones of Saul and Jonathan, his son, in the country of Benjamin in Zillah, in the tomb of Kish, his father. So they performed all that the king had commanded. And after that, God heeded the prayer for the land. So there was some business that needed to be cleaned up here. There was some things that needed to be taken care of. And, and uh, now that that had been done, you might remember that the bones of Saul were uh, confiscated and taken into the enemy camp of the Philistines and they were hung up as a trophy. So all this time, they've had his bones, and they've had Jonathan's bones, and it was kind of a statement from these dirty, rotten scoundrels that we defeated Saul, we defeated Israel, and, and here's, here's our trophy. Well, remember how many times David said, I'm not going to touch Saul. He's the anointed of the Lord. God chose him. You wanted a king? He picked Saul. He anointed Saul to be the king. And so all those years I've been running and hiding from Saul, I never laid a hand on him. I had opportunity after opportunity to kill him. I chose not to kill him because he was the Lord's anointed. Even though he was a scoundrel, even though he um, <laughs> had some serious mental problems, as we've seen how, you know, one minute he's, He's praising David. The next minute he's throwing spears at him. You know, uh, he has some issues, Saul did. But the bottom line was, David always gave him the respect and the honor that was due him as the king. Now we know that there was a time in Saul's life when the Holy Spirit departed from him. But David still looked at him as the anointed of the Lord. He was still sitting on the throne. Even though he was rotten, even though he was corrupt, David wasn't judging him for his behavior. David was honoring him because of the office that he held. So, for instance, oh, you could go maybe get a ticket for speeding. And say, you know, I'm going to contest this and I'm going to go stand before a judge and state my case. And so you go into the courtroom and there's this little old man sitting behind the bench up there with his black robe on. And he's the judge and he's got his little name plaque on the thing there and you're going to stand before him and you're going to state your case to him. Well, you don't know that man. That man might be an alcoholic. That man might be a pervert. He might be a good man. You just don't know. But that has nothing to do with why you're standing there in front of him. You're standing there in front of him because of the office that he holds. You're standing there in front of him asking him to hear your case and, and to, uh, To see it your way, so to speak. And so that's kind of how that works. I don't know, maybe none of you have ever stood before a judge. 
but it's a real intimidating thing when you do. It doesn't matter if it's a lady, an old man, a young man, a young woman. It doesn't matter. It's that black robe. It's that authority that that judge wields that you have awesome respect for, right? That judge has the authority to take away your freedom. That judge has the authority to take your money. You know, your, your case is really in that person's hands. Now, they might be the most corrupt uh, person on earth, but yet you're not thinking about that. You're honoring them because of the office that they hold. You're respecting them for that. And I think that that's what David demonstrates all the way through this whole process with Saul. This one final act, this one final thing where he gets these bones, he buries them properly, <clears throat> and it tells us that God heeded the prayer for the land. So, <clears throat> kind of an interesting story, kind of a, uh, a hard one to find application for for me and for you today. Nevertheless, we go back to the very thing we mentioned earlier, um, getting business taken care of. When God tells us to take care of something, we need to get it done. You know, you got this thing floating around in your life. I want you to purge that out. I want you to get rid of that because if you don't, you're going to have a spiritual famine or you're going to have events that are going to happen in your life. My, my hand of blessing is going to be lifted from you until you deal with that. Um, and that would probably be a believer who they're living in sin. They're practicing sin. I think, you know, it's obvious that none of us is perfect, right? We all make mistakes. But what's the difference between how I live now as far as sin goes and how I used to live? as far as sin goes. Because before I was serving the Lord, I would sin on purpose. I would make a conscious choice. I'm going to do that. Even though I know it's a sin. I'm going to do it anyway. Whatever it might be. But then we become born again. And, and how is our attitude to change between the old guy and the new guy? Well, the old guy was a slave to sin. That's what the Bible tells us. We really didn't have any choice when it came to that. We were weak in the flesh. But now that the Holy Spirit's dwelling within us, we have a choice. We have the strength through God to say, no, I'm not going there. That doesn't please God. I'm not going there. If I sin, it's going to be an accident. It's going to be something that I slip and stumble into rather than something that I run into headlong on purpose. And I think that's a good model for our lives. Because we do sometimes stumble into uh, thoughts or actions that do not please the Lord. Most of those things, I think, are stuff that you and I can't see. It's really easy to cover that up. It's easy to appear to be all together on the outside, but have unforgiveness in your heart. Bitterness or jealousy or insecurity. People can't see that. You can disguise it really easy. You know, it's not like an alcoholic. Whenever they get around you, you're like, whew, I can tell what your problem is, right? Well, people that harbor stuff inside of them like that, they can wear that costume every Sunday and no one will even know. God knows. And he would be beckoning them and he would be saying, you need to deal with that. Because I want to bless you. I want to restore you. But as long as you've got that in there and you're holding on to that, I can't. And it's going to create problems for you if you don't deal with it. So, 
He avenges the Gibeonites, and God hears the prayer for the land. Verse 15. When the Philistines were at war again with Israel, David and his servants with him went down, and they fought against the Philistines. And David grew faint. And then Ishbi Binab, who was one of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose bronze spear was 300 shekels, who was bearing a new sword, thought he could kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, came to his aid, and he struck the Philistine and killed him. And then the men of David swore to him, saying, You shall go out no more with us to battle, lest you quench the lamp of Israel. David's not quite as quick as he was back in the day. David's probably got a lot of aches and pains from all the battles he's been in. He's not quite the gladiator he was in his young days. And so this uh, uh, a son of Goliath is who we're talking about here. And you know he's bearing a new sword. Why is he bearing a new sword? Because David stole his dad's sword, right? <laughs> and chopped his head off with it. He's, he's bearing a new sword. And he thought he could avenge his father by killing David. And he would have killed David if it weren't for Abishai. So that's when they told David, it's time for you to retire, Dave. So now it happened afterward that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. And then Sibachai, the son, <clears throat> uh, the Hushathite, he killed Saph, who was another son of the giant. And again, there was war at Gob with the Philistines where Elnan, the son of Jaar Oryajen, the Bethlehemite, killed the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a beaver's whim, beam, weaver's beam. Yet again there was war at Gath. And there was a man of great stature who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in number, and he also was born to the giant. So when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimea, David's brother, killed him. These four were born to the giant in Gath, and they fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. So I think maybe Sunday school... History, um, we all know the story of David and Goliath. But seldom do we hear that he had offspring, and he had a brother, and he had sons, and they too were giants. So, question, who were these giants in the land? Why were they so big? Why were they so mighty and powerful? Were they descendants of a, a race of people who were the result of angels having sex with women and bearing children that were super duper human? I don't know. A lot of people think that that's what this is all about and... Somehow or another, they have survived the flood, they survived God's judgment, and here, uh, finally, it would appear that the last of these supermen, if you will, um, are dead. So you can close the book on that, too. This is kind of a closing the book up few chapters we have here. He gets the curse dealt with, gets the land back again. He gets the traitors taken care of and closes the book on that. And then he closes the book on uh, Goliath's offspring and, and these uh, 
uh, great giant warriors that, that they had and uh, takes them out. So that's where we're parking tonight. And uh, there's always giants in the land, right? Wasn't that the first thing they said before they went over? The guys came back and they said, man, we're scared to death. There's giants over there. You know, big guys. Six fingers. Six toes. And he was also an offspring. So, anyway, it's a cleansing, if you will, that we see going on here. And once again, God is blessing the land. Their harvest, I'm sure, is, is going to be a great harvest the next season. So next week, we will take a look at this psalm uh, that David wrote in chapter 22 to celebrate all these victories, all these closing the book on all these issues that needed to be dealt with. So we'll pick that up next week. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for these very, very interesting stories. Um, Lord, to draw spiritual lessons, to draw practical lessons from these, um, that's our goal. That's what we want to do. Uh, and so, Lord, as we go away from here tonight, help us, Lord, to be able to examine our own lives, uh, to examine perhaps things that we're holding on to, to examine perhaps things that we're doing even now in, uh, in our daily lives that are not pleasing to you, that, that we could purge those things out. Lord, that you would forgive us of our sins, of our shortcomings. Forgive us, Lord, for those things that we can so easily hide from men, but not from you. So, Lord, give us that anointing. Lord, give us that conviction of the Holy Spirit that you've called us to be holy people, not to harbor evil in our hearts. And we want to be holy people before you. We want to be spiritually healthy. We want to have a good harvest. We want our lives to be blessed. So help us with those things, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. Thank you for your forgiveness of our sin. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.